Welcome to Good Friday with Missio Mesa. I know the form of this is a little different, but the message remains the same. The cross and resurrection of Jesus are the white hot center of the true story. In the first act of the story, God created everything good, right, and beautiful. But in the second act of the story, human beings rebel against their creator. And the moment that they do that, death, separation comes into the world. And so human beings are at odds with God, their creator, with one another, with themselves, and even with creation. But God does not leave his world without hope. He promises a rescuer, a deliverer. And this deliverer, this rescuer is Jesus. Though we don't know his name yet, his story is woven throughout the pages of your Old Testament. And that's what leads us to today. So whether you're a part of Missio de Mesa or you're just curious about Jesus, you're welcome here. We hope that the next 30 minutes help to expose the horrific beauty of the cross. There's horror because on this day, God's innocent son was murdered for crimes that we commit. He felt the wrath of the father for sins that we choose. He absorbed the wound of this world that we might be set free. But there's also beauty. Beauty because we see forgiveness, healing, hope, and freedom personified we're able to catch just a glimpse of God's great love for his world. We're able to taste and see the devastation that sin causes and the deep love that Jesus has for his creation, for you, for me. So let yourself be drawn into the story. Look at the images, listen to the words, pray the prayers. If you feel moved to mourn, let the tears come. If you dare to dream that this could be for you, let that faith grow. Feel the amazement that, as Tim Keller says, we were so messed up that Jesus had to die for us, but we were so loved that he wanted to. If you find yourself needing a break, hit pause, then come back to it in just a bit. There's no wrong way to experience this teaching except to try to numb yourself from it. Thanks for joining with us. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you want to talk more about what you hear, let us know. We're glad you're here and trust that God will use this in your lives. Station 1. Jesus is tempted. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went a little further and bowed his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet... I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and he found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me for even one hour? Keep watch and pray that you will not give into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He could have walked away. The sacrifice of Jesus is meaningless if he has no choice. We find him on his knees in a garden of olive trees pleading, Father, if it be your will, let this cup of suffering pass from me. What is this cup? It's the cup of God's justice. God's world is broken and in pain. His ultimate creation, those who bear his image, destroy his world, each other, and themselves in a vicious cycle of fear, hatred, and shame. God's justice on the wrongs that plague his creation is meant for those who plague it. The plan before time was always that God would rescue his people from the contents of this cup. Yet, who could drink it that his people might not have to? He would drink it himself. Jesus' beautiful humanity is seen in this moment as he looks at the suffering he must endure to rescue his own and winces. The temptation to just walk away from the cross is very real, to go about this rescue by more personal, comfortable means to try anything else. Grief, desperation, fear. 
And what he chooses in the end is to surrender to his Father's will, to drink of the wrath of all things evil and destructive and twisted, to reap the reward of injustice and corruption and lies and hatred and greed so that you and I do not have to. He submits to his Father's will because we often refuse to do so. Father, we recognize that obedience to your way is not always easy. We confess that in a world of convenience and comfort, we often want to take the easy way out. Jesus, thank you for not taking the easy way. Thank you for trusting the way of the Father. Spirit, help us to be obedient as Jesus was. Convict us of our worship of convenience and comfort. Remind us of the way of the cross. Amen. Station 2. Jesus is betrayed. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. Matthew 26, 47 through 50. Jesus' prayer in the garden is interrupted by a mob. They carry torches and swords and come as representatives of the highest Jewish authority. Imagine the look of confusion on the faces of the disciples as they see one of their own, Judas, standing with them. He approaches the teacher and kisses him. The mob seizes Jesus and leads him away. The disciples flee for fear that they will be next, and our Savior is abandoned by those closest to him. For Jesus, there is no surprise in who has come or why he has come. Judas has come to fulfill his end of a deal struck with the religious leaders. Judas gives up Jesus and gets paid. We shake our head in disbelief. How could he? Yet, Jesus has charted a course that will take him where he will step in the gap to take on the judgment for Judas's crime. He will do it for him and for us. For who are we but the ones who have betrayed him? fled from him to save our own skin. Jesus' life is a constant battle for the throne of our hearts. We confess that more often than not, we reclaim the kingly duties of our lives. Though we confess with our lips that you are king, our hearts are ruled by things other than you. Forgive us, Jesus. You are the only true king. Spirit, will you show us the areas of our lives where we are worshiping Jesus with our lips, songs, and prayers, but rejecting Jesus in our hearts and actions? Amen. Station 3, Jesus is Condemned. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message, Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flog with a lead tipped whip and then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Darkness musters strength, 
to at last defeat its greatest enemy. The build-up to such a battle will be ugly. We see ugliness in the religious leaders who refuse to accept Jesus as their Messiah. We see ugliness when they incite the crowd to ask for Barabbas, a convicted murderer, to be set free. We see ugliness in a crowd of people so easily persuaded to evil. We see it in the man presiding as judge who, rather than make a just decision, refuses to accept his responsibility to do so. We see it again in the crowd who they themselves assume the responsibility for the death of an innocent. He is a victim of injustice. Justice itself turned upside down. He is convicted and condemned to die under the mad cries of crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So many people saying such horrible things, yet we hear nothing from Jesus. No protest, no outrage, just surrender not to the crowds or to Pontius Pilate or even to the religious leaders, but to his father. I am the coward. I am the thief. I am the liar. I am the murderer swept up in the wave of evil that breaks upon Jesus, who is still and silent. Yet how is it that I go free while he is sentenced to death? Oh, Lord. The Jewish officials didn't understand what it meant for you to be Messiah, and they condemned you as a criminal worthy of death. Your own followers didn't understand what it meant for you to be Messiah, so they scattered and hid in your hour of crisis. Help me not be like these. Help me to understand what it means when I confess you to be the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God. And may this confession lead me to a life of true discipleship. Let your kingdom come, Lord, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let this happen in my life, even today. Amen. Station four, Jesus is mocked. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. And then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes again. They led him away to be crucified. The Romans lead Jesus off to be prepared for crucifixion. The horror of the preparation is second only to the horror of the crucifixion itself. They beat him with rods and whip him with a cord that splits into nine tails. Each tail is laced with metal or bone or anything that might pound or tear his body. Then they place a crown on his head. And not a crown of the finest metals and jewels. It's a crown of thorns that would mock the would-be king. He is no king in their eyes. I see the cruelty of the soldiers and my own disregard for the king of kings. I dress it up, of course, or I excuse it away. But is it not my face he sees when he looks upon his torturers? Is it not my hand on the whip? Is it not my sin that has led to this? Is it not my rejection of his lordship that places the thorns on his very head? Gracious, merciful Lord, How hard it is to read of the abuse you suffered even prior to your crucifixion. I can't even begin to imagine what you felt, not only physically, but especially in your soul. What can I say in response but thank you for walking the path of suffering and shame for my sake. You took the abuse that I deserved and you gave your glory in return. Help me, dear Lord, to honor you as my king in all that I do. May my words and deeds reflect your sovereignty and celebrate your glory. Amen. Station 5. Jesus is given his cross. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. John 3, 14 and 15. The story goes on that while wandering in the wilderness, Israel, God's chosen people, once again rebelled against God and their leader Moses. They longed to be back in Egypt, 
the land where they were slaves rather than following this God who had set them free. They forgot his faithfulness to them and detested his provision. In an act of discipline, God sent venomous snakes among his people. Those bitten by a snake died. The people realized they had sinned and asked God to save them. Rather than taking away the snakes, God told Moses to make a bronze serpent and set it up high on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by a snake, if they looked to that bronze serpent, they would be healed. Whereas in the Garden of Eden, the snake tempted humanity to its own destruction and death. Choose your own way. God doesn't love you. In the story of the snakes, the snake becomes an instrument of salvation from death. Not only does poison rage within us, but we bite and poison each other. Jesus takes on the cross, an instrument of death and destruction, and makes it an instrument of salvation. He will use death to defeat death. His destruction will mean healing for those who gaze in faith upon the man lifted up. Dear Lord, you chose the cross. Yes, the Jewish leaders accused you. And yes, Pilate sentenced you. And indeed, Roman soldiers led you to Golgotha. But in a very real sense, they were simply working out what God had willed and you had freely and painfully chosen. How I thank you for this costly choice. Because you took up the cross, I can take up life in all of its fullness. Because you were led to die, I can be led into the eternal life. Because you bore my sin, I can enjoy your forgiveness. How good you are to me, dear Lord, my Savior. Amen. Station 6, Jesus Falls. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. The weight of sin is heavy. It's more than a cross or a bloody back. It's the debt that we owe for following our own path, for pursuing our heart's desires for sin. The debt is not his, it is ours, yet he suffers as a criminal. Don't all criminals get what they deserve? Do all who are innocent get what they deserve? It's a testament to the twistedness of this world that to set things right, he will have to suffer for the evil of others. It's a testament to his love that he endures faithfully. To heal our wounds, he will be beaten. To set right our wrongs, he will be wronged. To restore us to the path of life, he will take the path to death. Jesus, uh, the prophet Isaiah tells us that you carried the weight of all of our sin upon your cross. You were crushed for our rebellion, the world's rebellion, the wounds of creation. I admit I try to clean this image of you up. It's hard for me to look upon you, the one I love, as you are crushed and brought to your knees under the weight of my sin, our sin, the sin of the world. My sin, not in part, but the whole, rested upon you. Your death was certain, the cost clear, but you didn't waver. For the glory set before you, you endured. Praise to you, O oh God. Amen. Station 7 Simon carries Jesus' cross. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, 
daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Luke 23, 26 through 33. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus cannot carry his cross, maker of the universe, beaten, bloodied, and weak. The Roman soldiers grab a man at random from the crowd, Simon, and he is given Jesus' cross. Simon walks the road that is taking Jesus to his death. This is not Simon's cross. It is the Christ. The wrath of God to be borne upon it may only be borne by him. Yet, to follow him is to bear our own cross, not to a place called Golgotha, but certainly to our death. Our way would lead to our life, life as we think it should be. To follow Jesus is not simply to give it up or turn our back on it, or lower our expectations of what we want. We have to kill the life we want so desperately. Comfort, safety, self-exalting, we must kill it. Anything less than death of our life means a way of escape when following Jesus no longer meets our expectations. We must leave ourselves with nothing and no one else to depend on. Our hope must be in Jesus alone who will die on his cross, that we may have strength to carry ours. Dear Lord, the powerful example of Simon reminds me that I am also to take up the cross and follow you. You have called me to die to myself so that I might live for you. I confess that sometimes I resist this call, even though I know that in dying to myself, I find true life in you. So help me, Lord, to carry my cross, to give my life away so that I might receive the abundant life of your kingdom. I could not do this were it not for the foundational fact that you took my place on the cross. Through you, I am forgiven and invited into the fullness of life. In your death, I am raised to new life. All thanks and praise be to you, Lord Jesus, for bearing my sin on the cross so that I might bear the cross into eternal life, both now and forever. Amen. Station 8, Jesus is Stripped. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. John 19, 23 and 24. Jesus gave sight to the blind. The lame were made to walk. The dead were raised. Those enslaved by demons were set free. The poor were fed. Prostitutes, liars, thieves, forgiven. In these acts, Jesus is restoring creation to how it is supposed to be. Included in that restoration is restoring the dignity of men and women. The Roman soldiers gamble over Jesus' clothes, himself naked. He is not simply stripped of his clothes, but of dignity, of worth, of the very things he came to restore and gave to so many. He is instead exposed to embarrassment, ridicule, the contempt of the people he had come to rescue. Lest we think too highly of where we are in this story, if we take an honest look inside ourselves, 
we see the same evil in us. Jesus is the only innocent one among us, and yet he endures our evil. For it is the power of this evil he will undo and refashion into deliverance. Jesus, you were laid bare before all. The King of creation, the creator of the world, stripped and mocked by those you created. Forgive us, God. You were emptied so that we could be filled. You were stripped so that we could be clothed. You bore our shame so that we could be set free. Amen. Station 9, Jesus nailed to the cross. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. And then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. A sign announced the charge against him. It read, King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so that we can see it and then we'll believe him. Even the men who were crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. We see Jesus laid on the cross, his hands held widespread, stretching the length of the crossbeam. His feet are crossed down the length of the wood. The sound of the hammer on the nails rings out over the mountain. Hands that healed the disease and held the little hands of children. Feet that carried the message of love and joy and hope and wholeness now cruelly pinned to a cross. Amid the shock of his followers, the satisfaction of the Roman soldiers, the sneers of the religious leaders, Jesus speaks, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In the face of such deceit, such corruption, such violence, such hatred, Jesus has only words of love. Words of love for the religious leaders, for the crowd, for the Roman soldiers, for you and for me. Suffering, tenderness. We see in him a new way to overcome. This is what it looks like to rescue. This is what it looks like to love. But gracious Lord, how can I ever thank you for dying on the cross for us? Your death has given me life. Your sacrifice has led to my blessing. Yet I confess that I can sometimes take your death for granted, forgetting what you did for me and neglecting its significance. Forgive me, Lord, and even if I can't go to the actual place of your crucifixion today, may the reality of your sacrifice press itself upon my mind and flood my heart. All praise to you, merciful Lord, for your cross. Amen. Station 10, Jesus dies. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. He speaks it from the cross. The transaction complete, freedom in his blood as it poured out, the death of our death. All we see is a man dying on a cross, but God sees all the hatred, the evil, the lies, the brokenness, everything we have done or could do appearing on his son. Since the payment for all that sin is death and separation from God, Jesus dies under all our sin, separated from God. We heard him cry, God, God, why have you left me alone? Abandoned, alone, he completes his task. What was ours to bear, he has borne himself. He is the righteous 
and now dead for the unrighteous. The perfect sacrifice offered for those who could never pay their debt. He paves the way to God with his body and blood. The innocent is dead that the guilty may live. Who are we to be in the face of love? What are we to do in light of such love? Merciful Lord, thank you for being the righteous one. Thank you for your perfect life, your sacrificial death. Thank you for taking my sin upon yourself and giving me your righteousness in return. Like the centurion, I look upon your cross today with wonder, but I'm not only struck by your legal innocence, I'm astounded by your willingness to suffer and die for me, the righteous one for the unrighteous. All praise to you, glory, gracious, loving, giving, Station 11, Jesus is buried. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was indeed dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Joseph brought a long sheet of linen cloth, and then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance, Mark 14, 41 through 46. It's not a trick. It's not an illusion. Our Messiah is dead. The nails are pried loose, and his limp, battered body is gently taken down. Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, the council who condemned Jesus, comes forward. He asks to bury Jesus' body, a scandal to be sure to associate oneself with a known criminal. Yet he associates willingly and unashamed. Where is the kingdom of God now? Jesus is wrapped in linen and buried in a tomb. A huge stone is rolled over the entrance, sealed and guarded by soldiers to prevent any tampering with the body. Confusion, shock, grief cloak us. Is this the end? Is it enough to be free and separated from our liberator, to be loved so entirely and still left so empty? What life is there without him? What hope do we have if not in Jesus? Lord, Jesus, today we remember the fact that your death wasn't some charade. Rather, you really died. You experienced the ultimate penalty for our sin, for my sin. I'll never be able to understand the full wonder of your death, but I can grasp in part the fact that your real death opened up the door for me to experience real life. Faced with such a merciful mystery, I cry, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? To you be all praise and glory. Amen. <laughs>